Ruchika Tomer to come up on stage. Once again, let me tell you what this session is. This is our second session of the day. The theme of this session is beating the odds. You're going to have four people, a writer, an activist, a social worker, and a very popular television actor who's all going to come on stage and talk about their journey and how they emerged against all odds as trailblazers in their respective fields. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, there's been a clamor of voice seeking change ever since the horrific Delhi gang rape case. What exactly is that change? We are looking beyond systemic reform. We are looking beyond laws, legislations. And never has the issue of women's safety, or for that matter, general discourse surrounding women's issue been more mainstream than how it's been over the last few months. So today, the session is exactly that. We're going to talk about beating the odds, the odds that seem to be very, very heavily stacked against women. And we have uh, women from fields where they are thought leaders. They feel in, in their own fields, they have uh, their very well-known names. I'm just going to introduce our esteemed pa panelists for this session. We have Ms. Rinana Jhabala of SEVA, a renowned social activist. We have Meena Kandasamy. She's the uh, country's youngest activist, feminist poet. We have Sakshi Tawar, she's a TV actor, a very well-known face, almost a household name. And we have Kavita Krishnan, she's the secretary AIPWA, a CPM Politburo member, and also somebody, CPIML Politburo member. And uh, she's also somebody who has, uh, in fact, emerged as one of the strongest voices uh, in the Delhi gang rape protests that we saw in December and January. So let's just quickly welcome them before we begin this session. Okay, if I could uh, begin with you, Ms. Jabwala. Uh, moving beyond the legislation, we just heard some politicians who were here with us on stage. They were talking about what they have done, what they plan to do. I want to talk about everyday sexism, the garden variety of misogyny that we get to witness. Prejudices against women almost at all levels. Where do we begin to fight that? Um, I think... Uh, do I speak into this? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think uh, you are absolutely right. I mean, the outrage that happened with the rape, uh, it was an outrage not because every woman is raped every day, but because every woman faces some form of sexual harassment every day. And I, you know, coming from Seva, I want to uh, particularly highlight the issues that poor women face. Um, and in many ways, they are much worse than middle class women face. Um, one of the things that has been happening, say, in the last um, two decades is that women are actually coming out in very large numbers. And this move towards universal education, um, in almost all families, girls are now going to school. Whether you go to the rural areas, even to the most remote rural areas, girls are going to school. Uh, so the girls are coming out in very large numbers. Women are, girls have aspirations, they see television, they want to be something. They no longer are happy with being my, a future wife or a future mother um, and having no identity in the family. They want an identity. Uh, and what is happening is that with this kind of continuous sexual harassment, they get pushed back. Um, there is always the fear in the family and in them that 
if I assert myself as a person, then I'm being pushed back. Um, and I, just to um, give an example recently, from Delhi, in fact, I was in one of the poorer areas and I was walking there and I found that a lot of girls who had mobile phones and they had their ears plugged, you know, they were listening to music. And I asked one of them, you know, why are you walking on the road listening to music? And they said, because when we go to school, we have to hear such bad comments, many of them from people our father's age that we would rather just plug our ears like that and not listen. So I think what we need to worry about is how do we, what, how do we stop this everyday sexual harassment? And that's exactly what I want to ask Meena Kandasamy. But before I do that, I want you to take you through uh, some of her work. Now, she's written a lot of poems which have come in for a lot of praise, but also at the same time, I think it's offended a couple of people. Here's what she's written in something that's called Backstreet Girls. Well, this is what it reads like. Tongues untied, we swallow sons. Sure as sluts, we strip random men. Sleepless, there is stardust on our lids. Naked, there is self-love on our minds. And yes, my dear, we're all friends. There'll be no blood on our bridal bed. We're not the ones you will choose for wives. We are not the ones you can sentence for life. So Meena, I think um, you have been through a lot of reading sessions. Did you ever get a sense that you make people feel squeamish about your writings? Uh, I write actually to make a lot of people squeamish. So in that sense, I'm successful, you know, because the big problem that I face, I mean, like I learned early on is that if you suffer and you tell people that you're suffering, they're like, you know, they're just going to ignore you or tell you, you know, develop your patience and develop your negotiation skills and learn to how to put up with it. So the only way in which you can actually have a dialogue is to provoke them, is to offend people, is to get them in such a way that she's offending me. And I'm like, why am I offending you? What have I said that offends you? No, come, let's talk. So the only way in which, you know, if you're absolutely powerless and the only power that I would have is my words, then I really want to ask for a fight because unless we fight, unless we talk about all this in the open, and it doesn't open the space for dialogue. So, right, so you believe if you don't offend, you're not going to shake things up. You're not going to get people to talk about it. Yeah, being and a strong true person, I think that's exactly what uh, my writing, I think I wanted to do. So yes, makes people squeamish. But what people, as long as it gets them to talk, you're okay with it. Because the big problem is silence. You know, the whole issue is that we have this huge rape culture. We have this huge caste system, all of which are very detrimental to women and totally enslaves us. And there's this huge silence, right? Who, who think who kicks up a fuss about it? So you have to kick up the fuss. All right, you have to kick up a fuss to get people to talk about things because yeah. uh, we have to end the silence that's been surrounding all sort of yeah, become violence against women. Become professional troublemakers. Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> professional terminators. Let me bring in Sakshi here. Now, Sakshi has tried to do something which has been described as very bold for Indian television. Now, there was a 30-minute long episode which got talked about a lot on Twitter and other social media as well. There was a, a romantic scene uh, which was replete with lip lock and a whole lot of other things. And a lot of people were talking about it. Now, that was breaking the mold, Sakshi, in one way. But did you fear at some stage that you may, um, you may get, get uh, some sort of a backlash considering this, this image has been cultivated in minds of people of a nice, good bahu that you play in television soaps? No, I didn't feel that even once. Um, I was only skeptical about uh, how important it is to this story. As an actor, that is what I'm concerned about. Other than that, it didn't really bother me. And the best part is that, yes, we did get a lot of flag for it. Um, there are over 30 lakhs hits on YouTube for that. <laughs> so, uh, I don't understand that, uh, I mean, who's uh, watching it and who's the one who's criticizing it because uh, it's very easy to say that, ah, uh, uh, you know, on a family show, you showed something like that, though it was a very natural progression of the story. A uh, couple gets married and uh, after six months of their marriage, they consummate their marriage. And uh, the makers thought that it made sense to show something like that. The lip lock only came in the end, uh, which was post 11 o'clock. And... <laughs> 
<laughs> there were promos for it running for over two weeks, which was steamy enough, giving an idea of what is coming up. Yet people saw it till the end only to say, "Oh my God, our children were so embarrassed." That's why were the children up till so late to watch it with you? So I think we are in a society where we don't want to accept that we are so hypocrites. There's a lot of hypocrisy involved in all of this. But just one supplementary question I have: What if the character who you were making love with in that show wasn't your husband, was just your boyfriend? Would you have still done those scenes? If the story demanded, yes. As an actor, I'm only concerned about what, how justified my character is. Nothing else. Kavita, I know you speak on rights and legislation and whole lot of uh, things. Surrounding this subject, uh, but I want to talk about something else altogether. We are talking about issues of sensitization. We are talking about changing the mindset because that is just as important as formulating laws. If you agree with me, but um, here's something that is uh, spo- that has been spoken about, especially regarding the portrayal of role, um, portrayal of women in television soaps, in ads, in films. Do you think there's been too much debate over it? Are uh, these soaps not just mirroring what is the reality in our society, or you think uh, our television shows, our films, the roles that women uh, get to play in films uh, that has to come of age? Um, I'd like to start by actually framing, putting this in another frame altogether. I'd like to start by questioning the very frame of this entire program, which talks about women power and celebrating women power. The whole point is, you know, here in the previous session, there was one uh, woman politician, Smithy, who who talked about how oh, women have choices; they just have to realize that they have choices and they can choose to exercise them. That's not true. What Meena just said about there being structural oppression. Okay, the caste system in India and the f- structural gender oppression is something that stands in the way of women exercising any notion of free choice, and that is something we have to realize. Now, the pa- the ways in which that structure is maintained also uses ideological ways which includes several of the serials which have very it's not just serials i'll say even ads that later starter sky ad which talks about you know how the, the entire humor in the ad rests on the potential for the brother to erupt in anger because his sister is going to be taken out for dinner you know going to go out for dinner with a boyfriend you know we are living that's humor is resting on the potential for an honor killing that is where that humor is coming from it isn't just serials so you know so called modern corporation is actually peddling an ad like that so i'm saying you know you maintain the structural oppression in those ways couple of points i'd like to make one is that you know how do you come up against that structure when you struck meena said we have to fight you know you can't uh, you have to give a fight and of course women do but the point is that there you know there's a, there's an organized it isn't just that it's mindset and you know men's mindset mindset may not change for a long time but there's there are people working at organized maintenance of certain kinds of structures and certain kinds of mindsets such as you having the ours is a country where you have organized khap panchayats and then you have politics maintaining that you have organized brigades like the bajrang dal or the sang parivar brigades which say if you wear jeans we'll come and attack you if you celebrate valentines day we'll come and attack you and if you are a woman a hindu woman and you marry a muslim boyfriend or you marry out of your caste we will kill you there are organized groups like that so i'm saying you're not exercising choices in some vacuum and then you have a class oppression also we are sitting here you know and i am uncomfortable deeply uncomfortable because i know and as uh, you know uh, uh, rindana kar- correctly reminded there are so many women who cannot exercise the choice simply because uh, you know they are denied the basic uh, survival and it isn't just because oh you know god ordained it or somebody ordained it but it is because there is a structure that wants to keep them poor and exploit their poverty and exploit their labor and underpay them and that is what we are up against well nobody can disagree on that uh, the issues that you're raising are just as important and we've got to broad base all our discussions each time when we talk about women's issues in fact you have an objection kavita with even calling it women's issues we'll talk about that but i want to bring in meena here is there a lot of externalization of blame each time we talk about violence against women we blame it on the police for not policing properly not having the correct legislation but what about women uh, would you agree to some extent women are also worst oppressors of women be it in terms of mothers in law telling their daughters uh, in law what to do or mothers passing on you know the gentle advice so to speak uh, to their daughters 
um see the thing is it's it's uh, people blame women because it's easy to blame the victim and it's also a, it's